Happy holidays, everybody. This is Mary from the editing room. Just wanted to bring you this special episode, which we meant to bring you earlier this year, but then the strike happened and uh, we didn't want to cross the picket lines in any way, shape or form. So we've been hanging on to it for a special moment and we figured, you know, Christmas, Christmas. Why not release it on Christmas? So here you are. It is an exclusive interview with Lee McCluskey and Audrey Landers, Mitch and Afton Cooper, together again after like 40 years. Enjoy. Hey, get in here. Dallas is about to start. Okay, we're live. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Welcome to the Ewing Barbecue, where we're having a special DOA tonight. With uh, right now, Audrey Landers, and joining us soon is Lee McCloskey. So before, as I said in our promo, before we were spending our wonder years thinking about Winnie Cooper or hanging with Mr. Cooper, there were the Cooper siblings, Mitch and Afton. And mm-hmm. right now we have Afton herself, Audrey Landers. Audrey, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It's fun to be here. This is going to be such a great reunion for uh lee and me because i'm not sure the last time we actually saw each other but we'll figure that out when we're screen to screen yeah Mm -hmm. and and according to uh an email from lee just a little while ago he sent some pictures uh that are there that mary's going to pop up it's once lee gets on uh, a trip to israel i believe in 1982 yeah and i think carla apparently was pregnant with their first daughter Oh, really? Aw. At the time. It was a really incredible trip. I went with my mom. Mm -hmm. We went with Carla. Steve Steve Canale went with his wife. Oh, Susan Howard was there. Susan Susan Howard. Okay. That's a reunion we'd love to have. Steve and Susan. That would be fun to uh, us. That would be fun. Catch up with them again. Of course, you saw Steve and Susan in 2008 at South Fork for that big big reunion. Yeah, and I did see Steve at... um, on the reboot that we did, the TNT. Oh, that's right. <laughs> right. And that that's that actually brings up an interesting thing that I'll I'll ask you because you were on when um Jim Davis passed away and you were, came on yeah. after Larry Hagman passed away. Talk about the similarities and the moods on the set and just what the feel was because they were we both know, pivotal they were pivotal characters. And it was a changing point in the storylines and in the audience's perception. Um, for ex- when I first came on the show, as you said, it was uh, Jim Davis was still on the show, and then he passed away shortly after I arrived on the show. Um, and it was enormous. I mean, because he was. You know, at the time, it was so early in the series, and he was the backbone. He was the rock. And um, there was just so much of the Jock Ewing legend, you know. Um, And I was just getting educated about it, so to speak. And it was um, was hard. It was very sad. He worked, like, you know, to the last moment, it seemed from what I could tell. Um, And his wife was so lovely and it was just a very uh, tough time. It really was. And then jump ahead all those years. uh, It was like bookending with Larry too. uh, Yeah. And that was, uh, that was really hard. I mean, look, everyone knew that he was ill, but I, I don't know, you know, he's just one of those people that you just think he's just going to go on forever. You know, you just Mm. felt that about him. Um, So it was a really, it was a tough transition. It it was uh, tough in so many ways, you know, storyline, obviously, the cast. Everyone had to just deal with it in their own way. Yeah, and it was just such a void, too, to just lose both of them. It's just like. Well, especially after all these years, Larry was the show. I mean, he really was the show, and, um, and of course, was, your one of your first scenes was in bed with Larry, and <laughs> <laughs> that was the first scene I ever did on Dallas ever. 
I walk into the set at 7 a.m. after the 5.13 makeup call or whatever time ungodly hour it was, walked onto the sound stage, and everybody is there, and they go, okay, uh, places, please. This is Larry. This is the director. Hello, everybody, and hop into bed. <laughs> Jump in the deep end. <laughs> Literally. Okay, welcome to the show. Take off your clothes. <laughs> Of course, it was TV clothes, so you right, know, right you yes, mm-hmm. just bare shoulders. So, right, which would give and, you the illusion. And yeah. we we recently had um, Michael Priest on with yeah. uh, Kathy Podwell and Cherie Wilson, and eighty six years old, and he had stories upon stories. And he was a treasure what, trove of information. He was so wonderful, and then uh, just you know. By sheer luck, I got to work with him on a MacGyver that I did. And it was one of the fa- my favorite uh, shows that I ever did outside of Dallas, of course. Um, and it was an episode, what was it called? Two Times Trouble, where I played myself, you know, one character and the evil twin. And so... <laughs> It was so much fun. I got to sing and I got, uh, it was just uh, amazing. The, um, yeah, the opening of the, the episode was so much fun. Um, I sang a song called Higher Life where ostensibly we're shooting a music video and I'm this rock star. And so it was a very cool opening of the show. And Michael uh, did it. He was amazing. And speaking of uh, singing, um you were on – we've had other singers on the show. Deb Tornelli sings, Deb Bernard sings, and you were on with uh, Howard Keel, of course, during mm-hmm. the same time. And he obviously, from his theater background – um, I mean, like singing has been uh, – I think I was – that was really what started me in my career in the first place. I've been singing and writing songs since I was a young teenager. I had my first hit record when I was about 14. Uh, song I wrote wow. um, and, you know, just went on and on from there. And both soaps I did as a teenager, they wrote me in as a singer on Dallas. Then they wrote me in as a singer. That wasn't part of the initial storyline. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, I've had decades of gold and platinum albums now in Europe. Um, so it's, that is my, that has been a really, really um, exciting and a uh, huge part of my career. I was going to do this in front of my gold record wall, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> put a virtual one up, I would. I don't know how to do it on this, but uh, I know how to do it in the Zoom. You can put virtual backgrounds. I know in and, Zoom, and, yeah. yeah, because I'm, we're doing some construction on my office, and so <laughs> I had to take the records down. I said, "Well, I've got this gorgeous red drape, so why not?" Reminds <laughs> reminds me of the Red Room in Twin Peaks. To remember. Oh. <laughs> but um. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. Deb and I joked that they should have had a musical episode of Dallas where everybody sings. Because even, <laughs> even Patrick did a song in uh, in France with some singer. Yes, with Mireille Mathieu. Oh, yes. Because I already had loads of hit records at that time. <laughs> and I think Patrick and I ended up uh, both being guests on that variety show. Cool. Oh. Mm-hmm. Uh, do, do you remember your audition process or how you came in on the show and of course i do my god how could you not (laughs) Um, it was first of all it was nail biting okay it was the show was already a hit you know Mm. it's i think it had been on for a couple of years already so many people were very familiar with dallas i was not one of those so a friend of mine gave me uh some VHS cassettes that his mom had taped and said, you got to watch the show. And so it was wonderful. I got the feel for the show. And um, Afton was this very, um, she was a floozy. And my personality was certainly not that. I had just moved from New York and I had done all these wholesome commercials, Johnson and Johnson and Lifesavers. And, and here was this like, you know, hot to trot. And so 
think about how am I going to dress for this? And so I borrowed clothes and, you know, I really tried to look the part. And um, I auditioned among, uh, along with so many other talented, wonderful actresses. And, um, you know, call back, call back. Third call back was on a Friday night. And so uh, you have to wait the whole weekend, <laughs> which is so often the experience. And I was just thrilled to get that call from my agent Monday morning that I had been chosen. But, uh, you know, so, the competition was very stiff. It was, you know, it was a hit show. It was a wonderful character. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so it, it was really, I, w I felt so lucky. I felt so lucky. So that that was a quick turnaround for Friday night and then Monday you were finding out. Uh... Well, but it was weeks before of auditions. That was the okay, yeah. all back already. So before they were already, <laughs> you know, casting director, director producers you know you, you move right. on the line and um it was the final callback was on friday afternoon okay and the final callback and then quick turnaround monday you find out you get the part and where, oh, where you are it's a whole weekend of saying, oh my <laughs> <laughs> that that is that that is when you're waiting it can feel <laughs> like an eternity it's like somebody somebody said uh there's a sign once on a inside of a bathroom it said how long a minute is depends on what side of the door you're on. Oh, very true. Yes. And I know, Mary, you keep talking about it in our episodes. Uh, Afton is a clairvoyant. She's the smartest oh, person. Oh, yeah. I, I, so, <laughs> so I'm rewatching. So our whole shtick with our podcast is that we watched it when we were inappropriately young children. And now we're going back as adults and rewatching it. Okay. And so... I'm seeing everything almost like, you know, with a fresh set of eyes as an adult. And I think that Afton is the most intelligent, smart person on the show of Dallas. She always knows what's going on, mostly like emotionally. She's yeah. very intuitive. She's always telling people, hey, do this. And it's like the, if they would have taken that advice, they would have been fine. Absolutely. And, you know, the character had such a wonderful arc. You know, yeah. uh, you know, she started out as just this opportunistic gold digger, basically. Mm -hmm. But when she, you know, gets further along in her maturity, I mean, the character did appear th throughout many years, you know, mm -hmm. all consecutive, but coming back um, over eight years. And um, I think that Afton... It was just wonderful the way the writers wrote her maturity, you yeah. know, and I would get uh, so many letters from fans and like they would say, well, why are you still with Cliff Barnes? Why are you still doing this? And uh, why didn't you leave him already? And then, you know, you have to credit her with, you know, she loved him and she felt that she could make it work and she didn't just give up on him that easily until right. it was no longer possible to live that way you know mm -hmm. and so and i love it looks like we have lee is hey, finally here lee. hello hello i i'm hoping that uh you can am i moving on your end i can't you, you're not moving for us okay <laughs> also see. my image on this side is reversed oh, I don't know oh. Why. <laughs> um so that's very, very strange. Hello, Audrey, my beautiful friend of Me? many moons. <laughs> so good to see still you. Frozen. Is he still frozen for you? Yeah, for me, yeah. Okay, let me just see what I can do here. Do you go out and come in again? The internet's so finicky, but we have it. So. As, my as my little French grandmother used to say, qu'est-ce que c'est internet? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Lee McCluskey, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, and you got to work with, uh, well, actually, I'll hold that one for Lee when he gets in here. But um, I'm going to move this over just a little bit so you can that, see. Yeah. That was an interesting thing that you started to bring up because I had it written down about the evolution of your character over the years because i i went through and the way i found the clips of you and lee together is i went to internet movie database 
and I matched which episodes you were in together. Yes. Yes. Dump them all, dump those episodes on the computer and then scrub through and found all your scenes together. <laughs> and, your, and your first scene was at the airport with Anne Francis and Charlene yes. Tilton and Lee. And the first thing out of your mouth is, do you really have all that money? <laughs> <laughs> you looked like you were just out of high school or something in that, you know, just the, the clothes and the hair and just... Uh, yeah. Dun, dun, Am dun, I dun, moving? Dun, dun, dun. There you are. There's oh, yeah. Lee, everybody. Moving. Hello, hello, yeah. hello. Hey, wow. So, oh, so good to see you. Good to you see know, Audrey, you. I was looking at pictures from Israel with Mary, you. Mary, you, you want to throw those up if, you, if we have a chance? Sure, yeah. yeah let, let me. I would love to see those pictures. Yeah. I don't. I, I, and I'm wondering if that's the last time we saw each other. It could be. I mean, I can't. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think there might have been. I don't know. Let's, oh, here we go. There we go. Do you see them? There's Susan Howard and Steve, too. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Susan Howard and Steve. You were yeah. all on that trip yeah. together. Yeah. That was so every, everybody listening or watching or however you're viewing us, uh, smoke signals or whatever, this <laughs> is apparently the first time for the two of them in. That was what forty one years ago. Please, oh, years. Years. <laughs> time is so dumb. You know when Audrey and I were six. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's my mom. See, and yeah, Carla. there's your mom. There's Carla. Oh. Yeah. yeah, and uh, Ruth. I believe uh, Carla was pregnant. I. I I got think the message you that, that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 80, 1982. That's when Caitlin was born. Wow. That's around the time uh, Charlene had Cherish. It was in around 1982, 83 or thereabouts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Wow. Oh, you all, you all look like you're, you all look like you're on a, uh, Vacation from college or something. So <laughs> kind of felt that way. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And then we had Great. And we had a we had a quick little montage. Oh yeah, just to refresh everyone's memory. Okay. This is what I went through Internet Movie Database to find all your scenes together. <laughs> I'm sure you had a favorite scene. Maybe let's see what we got here. Hmm. This is Lucy. Lucy, this is my mother and my sister, Afton. Hi, Mrs. Klumper. So very nice to meet you. Hi, Afton. You really have all that money? Afton? <laughs> Just wanted to know. Thank you. You bought up the whole store? Well, before you say anything, oh, Lucy, I'm spending all that money on us. You just take a good look at your sister. She's never had a dress like that before. She loves it. Sure, I like it. Makes her feel like she belongs. I mean, turning down $5,000, who else on earth would do a thing like that? It, it's dumb. I mean, it's just plain dumb. To me, it was the only ethical thing to do. I'm a doctor. I took an oath to help sick people wherever and whenever, and that has nothing to do with money. You still don't see why you're having such a hard time seeing my side of it. Mitchell, you're really being stupid. I mean, what'd they do that was so terrible? They don't care what I want. They were trying to buy me. If it occurred to you, they might have been thinking about Lucy's happiness. You can't blame them for wanting the best for her, just like I would for Afton. And I don't see what you think is so wonderful about this crummy apartment of yours anyway. Can I get a drink? I don't think Milton stocks any chocolate shakes. Afton, please. Lucy and I split up. Permanently? Looks that way. You're a real fool, you know that, Mitch. What are you talking about? I'm talking about you and your idiotic standards. You drove that girl away. That's enough, Afton. No, Mitch, no, it isn't enough. You had something so good going for you. You had a wife who truly loved you. But that wasn't enough. You also wanted her to live like a pauper. Maybe I made a mistake. Oh, Mitch. Hmm? Um, put on something nice, okay? Something nice? Yeah, you might as well make a good impression. You are a doctor. What's wrong with the way I dress? You know, you're so cute. I don't remember any of these. Did you <laughs> see? And, and, and there, was, two of us. <laughs> there was there was another great scene where 
Larry was uh, giving you crap at the nightclub, and Mitch comes in and punched Larry. <laughs> I do remember that one. <laughs> Did you? Somebody had to. <laughs> right. no. yeah. yeah, he he, he deserved sure. it. <laughs> Did you have a favorite scene? Most memorable scene together, or I know you got to work that's with Anne Francis. That, should have been, that if, if you punched Jr. Okay, <laughs> that had to be the best scene ever. Okay, I mean, <laughs> his, 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 not that many people ever punched him and got away with it. Okay? That's true. <laughs> it's it's true. I, I I have to look at it that way. Even if I don't really remember the, the scene. <laughs> I'm glad I punched him. Yeah. <laughs> Defending my sister. Of, it's uh, so nice seeing those scenes. I mean, even, you know, Mary, we were talking a few minutes ago about the evolution of that. And then you can see, even in that little short yeah. period, how she went from, oh, you, really, you know, you have all that money to, you know, sprucing up her brother, telling to get with the program, you know, her mm-hmm. intuition. And you, you went from, Cliff, you're a loser to being at his bedside uh, after he tries to kill himself and just the way you're changed. And uh, talk about, uh, obviously, obviously you both worked with Charlene and you, you worked with Anne Francis as well as your, mm-hmm. as your mother. Do you talk about uh, those two and just what, uh, what it was like working with them and Priscilla Pointer, who just turned yes. 99 and is still with us. Wow. Incredible. Well, Anne Francis was, well, you know, she is from a whole different era in Hollywood history. Okay. So that was very exciting to have her play our mom. And I also, she also ended up playing my mom in um, a fantasy island I did. I think it was actually before I got Mm -hmm. Dallas. And so she had played my mother in that as well. So I guess there was a connection. <laughs> yeah, I, I, she, was, I, she was just obvious. No, I just Anne, as as Audrey was saying, was it was uh, I I really uh, between her and Barbara Belgetti's and some of the, I mean, just some of the the what you, as you say stars from another another time another era. But it was quite an honor to work with them, uh, mm-hmm. because they really just have that gravitas of. Mm-hmm. Of experience, so I really, I very much enjoyed him playing the Honey West, playing my mom. <laughs> Honey yeah. West, that was the show. I, was, I had the name on the tip of my tongue, and yeah, um, you two obviously came on right after Who Shot Jr. And it was just, uh, what was it like first coming onto the set? Were, were you limited run characters, or I know, I think Lee, you had a was it a two year deal? Well, it was, it was, uh, it became a two year deal. Uh, it was, uh, yeah, the, we were the bringing in, uh, the, you know, basically the younger storyline of, um, uh, just joining it. I joined when, uh, when we were shooting in Dallas. Were you there, Audrey, in Dallas shooting or did you? Yeah. So, yeah, it was. We... And then there was a strike. Were you there during, in the very beginning, when I first got the role? Uh, we flew to Dallas, and I don't know if it was a writer's strike or an actor's strike, whatever strike it was, and we had to uh, hold off shooting for like a week, and we all hung around the hotel waiting, waiting. What are, are they going to settle? Are they going to settle? And then we ended up flying back to L.A. and not shooting then again for, you know, oh. I guess a month or so later. Um, that's a memory I have because I took that month and went hiking in the high Sierras. So. <laughs> <laughs> so perfect. You have a market. Take, take, adv- take, take advantage of the time off, uh, basically. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think that when um, speaking for myself, my character was only supposed to be in for two episodes. Oh, wow. Um, Captain yeah. was just two episodes, not two years, just two episodes. And I guess the good fortunes had it that uh, they thought the character had potential once they saw me on film, you know, and that was just. I mean, it was amazing. And, you know, the character wasn't supposed to be a singer either. And that happened because uh, one of the early shows, um, I, it, you know, I would like get a call. My agent would say, OK, they want you for three more episodes. OK, they want you for two more episodes. And it just kept building like that until until it 
became until it stuck, you know? Ste- uh, steal me away. No. <laughs> yeah. and, and look, when I started uh, writing those songs, um, you know, I wrote Steal Me Away just kind of became uh, synonymous with Afton the singer. Did you and, actually write the song? Oh, yes. I wrote all the oh, songs. That's awesome. And I would get the script and I would say, what is she feeling right now? And I tried to make Afton a little more of a human not, as yeah. opposed to just a, you know, a gold digger. Right. You know? And so Steal Me Away, the inspiration was that she wanted uh, JR to fall in love with her. And she wanted to see if she could really win him over. And that was um, the inspiration for that song. Um, and that and- resonated between you and sue ellen all the way down to the new series right before that wedding yeah. with john yeah. ross and pamela rebecca and uh you and sue ellen getting in that little fight at south fork uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all those years later you're still fighting <laughs> yeah. it would have been a fun storyline to pursue you know my daughter yeah. and jr's son it would have mm. been right. an interesting storyline to right. expand upon yeah. And you both, your characters both changed over the course of the series. Uh, Bitch went on to become a plastic surgeon and down in Atlanta. And as JR said, if he could only have designed Lucy with a new mouth, uh, without a mouth. uh, (laughs) um, Talk about, as you were talking about earlier, just the growth and the change. And what, what did you see in the growth and change of each other's characters? Just, I always like to have people talk about the other person and their performances and just kind of I, I, I'll, I'll t- I really was delighted when Audrey was cast I think she's an exceptional actress and just human being as well so she was always a delight I wish I had more specific memories but I simply remember that when she and Anne came in uh, to work with both of them was uh, very delightful and um, and in a way uh, created a certain sense of hope that that things would develop in in certain directions and uh um and with mitch he just got kind of stuck you know i i'd love to say that that he evolved into a, a more and more interesting character but i think you know to a certain degree he we we're written a bit into a into a corner and uh, uh yeah. you know i i just i i I've always felt that way, but I, I really felt that uh, Audrey was such a such a plus to the show. Thank you. Oh, I always yeah. felt they they didn't um, utilize your character as well because they made the overwhelming characteristic was your stubbornness. To me, oh, that's yeah. how yeah. I always yeah. thought that, Lee, that uh, Mitch was just stubborn and unwilling to change or to bend, and I think. You know, yeah, which yeah. which is an interesting thing so to start far. with, but not to stay with. Yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. And then they they brought in a couple of other people. You had a thing with uh, Ellen Bry, who came on as uh, the, mm-hmm. the student that you were with, uh, uh, and then um, Patty McCormick from the Bad Seed ended up playing uh, the Evelyn Michelson that you had the affair with uh mm. and ended up leaving lucy with but um mm. you you did end up moving on to atlanta and you plastic surgery and then you got back with lucy where did you where would you have seen your characters today as if as they evolved uh if you know i think that when the the reboot they gave afton a really interesting uh solution you know i think they had her i mean she was clearly married to someone else okay and she was successful and self-assured and probably still singing in cabarets but you know classy ones Mm -hmm. um and looking out for her daughter as she did towards the end of my run in the first you know in the series so i think that that's where afton would be today I think they kind of nailed that one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, and Mitch, obviously, probably running the hospital, maybe? Uh, <laughs> yeah, Mitch would be the admo- hospital administrator with a very <laughs> modicum of humor. Uh, yes. Get things done. 
<laughs> and, and, yeah, and maybe an a, a incredible art career on the side as we see yeah, all who the knows? artwork. There might be this hidden double life that he's leading that, uh, unbeknownst for appearance's sake, that uh, he's actually <laughs> far more interesting than it might, <laughs> might be assumed. <laughs> and I, I had asked Audrey about, uh, we were had been talking about Michael Priest and some of the directing. Right. And do you have memories of uh, specific directors or Michael Priest or? I always liked Michael very much. He's a very genuinely good man and a nice man and a gracious man and, and a good director. So, no, I, Michael was great. Carla, my wife, worked with him as well. So we know Michael from other um, okay. other shows we, that he's done as well. And and we, had him wife, on, uh, we had yeah. him on last month with uh, Kathy Podwell and Cherie Wilson. Oh, sure. Uh, and, he, and he just... He talked and talked. He, he, we could listen to him all all night. Uh, just tell yeah, us. He story. was amazing to listen to. Really, and I, um, you, I loved working with him. And then I worked with him again on that MacGyver episode that he directed, and he was just super supportive and just yeah. obviously a really top notch director. But he was just so supportive, uh, and it was a joy to work with someone like that. Yeah, and what. What brought about both of your ends on the show? I, I know they wrote you out, obviously, Lee, you just back to a new corner. And then, Audrey, you obviously. Were I you... popped in and out over the years. That's <laughs> true. Actually, actually, you both popped in and out a few times. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Did you yeah. notice a different. A, did you notice a change in the mood on the set or the vibe when you would come back years later? Or was there a different feel or. Yeah. Yeah. When I came back later, it wasn't as happy a place as it was when Jim was alive. And it just didn't, it just, for me, it didn't have, but again, I was visiting. It's a different thing than being with people all the time and coming and visiting, you know, saying, Hey, how you doing? I'm on makeup and, you know, let's go to the scene. And, you know, so, but, but it, um, it, it, there was, because uh, coming on with the who shot JR energy, there was so much, energy around the show there was so much excitement around the show there was so much of a sense of and and i think it's it's you know and it's it's a show that went into the long haul meaning there really were years of creating more and more and and you know some of the people were uh more enthusiastic earlier on than, than when i had come back to visit but not as a critique i don't mean that they weren't being nasty yeah. which, well, which just wasn't the same because it did like you said up front about sort of a, a college vibe you know there, there was a time where it seemed like there was more of a of a type of collegial like everyone's on this crazy show together and uh and then it's just sort of hopefully they didn't haze the new guy looking <laughs> well for me it was a little different always i mean when i first joined the cast um i i tend to be very serious anyway and so I never felt that collegial atmosphere. I was always like, focus, do your work. Don't, you know, if somebody makes a joke, ha ha, laugh at it. But, you know, I'm, I, I kind of approached everything with blinders on. And as the years went on and I was doing my recording career in Europe, it was really challenging because I was commuting from either L.A. or Dallas, depending where it was, on like a Thursday night, if I could get off a Friday. And I would go to Frankfurt or Paris, and I would do like three days and nights of concerts and TV shows and press and whatever, and just fly right back and show up on the set, you know? And so... For me, it was, um, you know, I was always coming in and out and it took, for, uh, it honestly took for me a lot of um, focus <laughs> for me to just stay in character, to do my job, to make sure I knew my lines a thousand percent. I never wanted to be the one person that they had to do with take two because of me, you know, and, and it was a little serious. <laughs> and that, that must have been hard to say. Focus when you have Larry and Patrick pulling practical jokes all the time, all over the. It was, but I would be the brunt of those jokes. I, I never like, uh, and I'm not saying this in a negative way, but I was never part of the family, and I was never that inner circle from, that was there from day one. So 
you know, I, I always, uh, I, I loved being around everyone. And I think it was a, an incredible atmosphere, but I don't think I ever was fully immersed in the, the fun of it. You know? <laughs> Mm-hmm. I, 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 I would I would agree with that too. I mean, I I do think that yeah, there was a difference of being in the family and just being visited, you know, in a sense marrying to it. It was different <laughs> because I think it also come up from from where it was just a shot in the dark that the show might go. Do you know? So they had that, mm-hmm. so that they had the legs of the entire show in them. And, and it is it it is harder. I agree with you, Audrey. When you come in, because you do come in wanting to be very professional, because you don't necessarily think you're going to just click with everybody. It's, you know, you, you have to just be really prepared. And, uh, and right. that was, and my that fallback was, is not yeah. joke and have fun. My fallback was just do a great job, you know, just mm-hmm. do your part, the best that you can do it. Don't look at anybody else and, you know, don't compare yourself to anybody else. Just, you know, cause it was a very intimidating show to uh, join. I mean, I can imagine. It, it, was, it, it was intimidating. So you had to kind of put all that as, for me. I had to just put all that aside and say, OK, and this so, is my work. And, and so, I love my character. I love my lines. I love being here. And I can't think about this is the number one show in the world. You know? <laughs> right. And sometimes it felt like when they would cut to Mitch's hospital scenes, I felt like I was switching over to like a hospital drama, like, okay, let's switch over to St. Elsewhere for a second here and see what's going on at the hospital yeah. and, and then back. Yeah. So it was kind of like he was running parallel to the storylines that were and, going and on I with the main family. Answers, answers the question of why the character uh, lasted two years and, and not longer. I think, you know, in a way it is running into the writer's problem of what do we do with the character that we kind of boxed into uh, a corner in terms of, the, the the characteristics and um and oftentimes there is there's that sort of remarkable moment of kismet where it, it clicks and there's a because i always thought felt mitch should have given you know in a sense he should have become more interesting like like fallen into corruption in a sense not even that he wanted to but he became in a sense almost out of necessity he had to compromise his values because there was something yeah. rather um artificially uh Cro Magnum about him at times, which was, you know, it's my money, your money. It was it was it was kind of a, a very flimsy conflict uh to really make it about yeah. Yeah. that over and over and over. A, you know, the one picture thing, him as a caveman, drag the woman back to the cave. Oh, me man, me yeah. make money. You need to work, woman. I, I work. <laughs> yeah. they, they could have given you a, a spin-off, uh, set in a hospital in Atlanta and just said hospital yeah. drama. <laughs> Uh, well, I played more so, than a few doctors in my life. <laughs> yeah. What What do you take away from your experience on Dallas, and just how it helped you grow as a person? As a because Patrick Duffy always calls it the gift, the gift that keeps on giving. I mean, I have a mm. picture up on the wall here of an autograph show of the Hollywood show where Lee, you're actually in it, and there was Jenna Lee Harrison, Morgan Brittany, and all these other Morgan Woodward oh. was there, and everybody. But um, so, uh, so obviously, you've all done some of the autograph shows. Audrey, you and I met in 2012, right before Hurricane Sandy down in New Jersey. We got out of there just in the nick Just in time. <laughs> and and Morgan, Morgan was there, too. Morgan Brittany was there, yes. But um, what do you take away from the whole thing and just the Dallas legacy and why it's lasted so long? And I, I think that for me, you know, Dallas... Uh, enriched my life and my career in so many different ways because, you know, we talked about a little earlier that, you know, I started my career singing and writing songs and I, my first hit record at 14, something I had written and, you know, and then, uh, Dallas allowing me to sing was just a wonderful expression and, um, exposed me as a singer and a musician once again, but to the whole world. And that's what kind of launched my recording career worldwide. Um, so that was tremendous for me. And um, so I was just so fortunate that the character was able to combine my two creative loves, three, acting, singing, and composing, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it really was amazing and the reach of dallas around the world is incomparable it's there's really nothing like it today maybe game of thrones 
Okay. <laughs> and, and you're going to be at the event with uh, Linda, Patrick, Charlene, Steve, Kathy, Cherie, and Joan Van Ark is going to be there too. I heard. Yes. And on our podcast, I think Michael Priest said he might even be attending that as well. That's possible. But uh, Lee, that's out in Palm Springs if you're in the area on June third. <laughs> June thirteenth. Uh, I'm driving by. If, if you want to pop over, and, if you want to yeah. pop over and say hello, but uh, yeah, but and you and your your takeaway just from what it taught you about your craft and just everything and just well for me it was it was a different uh, it was a different experience because I had started in the mid seventies and enjoyed a, a lot of very interesting roles and sort of um, uh, like uh, you know my first series I had executive suite I had a black girlfriend so it was biracial that I played. It. Hustler and Alexander, the other side. Don't you know? So I was playing very interesting characters. And Dallas came along, and uh, it was what Audrey said. It was fascinating because I'd never been around something that had that kind of buzz, that type of excitement. So that was that was a learning experience in terms of a type of collective experience of when something is so popular. And you are known beyond, in a way, when I'd go to Europe, people would say, Meech, Meech, Meech. Um, and all of that was very much a uh, an interesting uh, development. I think my frustration with Mitch as an actor, um, I find that why it was so valuable is that Dallas allowed me to move where I live now. It gave me an opportunity, mm -hmm. and it made me very aware that if I needed to have uh, uh, creative conversations that I needed to have, then I needed to do them where I lived rather than try and find them in Hollywood or find, you know, in other words, it really was, it, it, it sort of, uh, awakened me to a double life, meaning that, um, uh, I, I had heard a great deal. Oh, they're so successful. This is so great. And I thought, it is. It's. I'm so happy to be working because any actor that tells the truth is happy to have a job, happy to be working. But there's also that sense of of when you go to work and you're playing a very exciting character, how how there's just an energy about that as well. And I could never quite get my um, my my. I don't know. It's it's like it taught me to be more proactive to actually go and sit with writers and say, you know what, I have some ideas because I never like to do that. I don't like to interfere with other people's jobs so to speak but it right. it was it was fundamentally a profoundly important pivot in my life because it took me in the direction of art i still continue to act i've always loved acting and uh, even did a film last year but i i feel that um it opened my eyes to the fact that um that if one wants to have a type of really invigorating uh, creative life that you it, it can't be around you know, a lot of times with Hollywood about trying to get the next job or trying to it really is about creating a space and that's what I did was I created space for yeah. friends and community to gather and, mm -hmm. and, uh, that's and, really and you, and you go ahead and you both don't live in Hollywood either so Audrey you live on the east coast and I do yeah, Lee lives on the, yeah. and but the thing that I really um cherish about my experience on Dallas was, of course, I loved the character. I loved, as I said, the opportunity to sing and to write the songs. Character had a beautiful arc. Um, and then, you know, they the producers were so accommodating when I was cast in the movie, A Chorus Line. And I was so fortunate that after that whole thing happened, that they actually found a way to bring Afton back. You know, and the character had some relevance, even though I thought that's that would, you know, where is she going to go to from here? And the writers and producers were just brilliant in that, you know, and for me, it was oh, I got that little a little more taste of it, you know, and I, I really. Um, even in the reunion movie, too, you came back oh, in the, the 1996. Well, and I mean, then, I'm talking about even like, you know, yeah. the first 80 through 84, 85, then doing a chorus line and then coming back 89 and then again and then the last season. And, you know, just, you know, Afton is just like a little spark <laughs> they would throw in here and there. And for me, it was a wonderful little spark because I was doing so many other things and it just kept reaffirming to the fans that Afton still existed, you know? Right. And I, and and I, I love it. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and I know you have to head out, uh, you. but do you have any 
final messages or current projects or anything you want to just get out there before you? I, I do. You know, I, my, I, I'm working on a few very exciting projects. My son, Daniel Landers, is my collaborator, buddy, um, co-producer, um, and we've written a dark pop musical film. And he has written a um, an irreverent d- crime comedy TV series. Really? And so, yeah. So we're working well, on I- things together, and it's... Uh, and when those come around, we'll have to have you back on to yes. promote them and talk about them. And uh-huh. obviously, Lee, we keep talking about coming on and after the pod, after the barbecue podcast, just to talk about your art and just some of your other work that you want to do at some point. Um, right. It'll yeah. be a great opportunity to promote uh, what you're doing now and just speak about some of your new passions and stuff like that, too. So, well, um, Lee, it was and- so nice to see you. I hope we get yeah. to see you. They're uh, in person. I would love if you come out to the West Coast, please come and say hello. Thank come you. by and let's. I, I just, you were a particular pleasure. I always adored working with you. And I've always felt about Audrey that, and working with her as well, is that when I think of Lana Turner, I think of old, I always thought of old time movie stars well, that she had that sure. elegance and that beauty that, that is just. So oh, yeah. special and so radiant. So, but it's also inside. Be- wow! Way back in the day, Lana Turner and I met right after she had written her book, and she wanted me to play her. Really? You have her energy. You have that type of natural, sensual. Yeah, I, yeah. And I, yeah. I just finished watching her on Falcon Crest with uh, Jane Wyman, wow. and uh, but this was way the, back before that. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, yeah. And, she, she, she gave me her. I I even have a gown that she wore. She went. We went you, to you would have been perfect to play her. I, I think because you have that. Well, it, you well, know, it, it 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 because it's it it just it was fabulous. So, I'm, so we I'm need a Lana happy. Turner biopic movie with Audrey as well. Lana. Now I'm too old for it. Okay. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> okay. It happens. Oh. <laughs> yeah. so some letters from her and um uh, we didn't have iphones so we didn't take that many pictures then but um yeah. uh i still have the the photo session where she coached me how to stand and oh it's that's just awesome great. that's great that's, yeah but that's great this, is, this has been a great little uh mini reunion here i know you two hadn't <laughs> spoken a long time and Audrey will be out in the West Coast in June. I don't know if you're in the area, but um, it's uh, it's been great having yeah. you both on. And, yes, thank uh, you so much. Thank uh, you so so much. Yeah, um, we'll do Mary, it again. We really will have to see each other in person. Yeah. Yes, and we will. We'll, we will have. Congratulations on your life and, and, and Lee. <laughs> thank and you. Lee, Lee can become once Lee does the after the barbecue uh episode he will be uh our first three-time guest so nice. like saturday night live he can get one of those jackets for where <laughs> <being, yeah. laughs> so it's the little things that matter <laughs> it is it is yes so yeah, yeah. all right okay Mary, well, you, want to you. A, you want to do a quick close uh yeah thanks for thanks for joining us on the ewing barbecue podcast uh and um join us next time josh do you know what episode we're on Season six. Uh, season six. Uh, we're fighting over Jock's will right now, so yeah. that's yeah. that's prime <laughs> prime storyline material. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Until next time. Bye. Bye. Y'all come back now. You hear? Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.